Hello folks and welcome to this short presentation on teaching circuits in grade 9 science, a survival guide. So if circuits or electricity is not your expertise, in this session we'll go through the key ideas of the unit and give you lots of tips and suggestions on how to get through it and do a great job. So let's kick things off here. One of the key questions I think is what to cover and also what to leave out. And my advice is, don't try to cover too much. This unit is also connected with the grade 11 physics course, where we follow up on a lot of these concepts and ideas. So leave some stuff for us to do as well in that course. So for example, consider skipping over the topics of electrical power and efficiency. Skip voltage in series or parallel circuits. I'm going to explain more about voltage because it's a particularly challenging concept for students, even at the grade 11 level. Uh, skip an exploration of the thickness of wires and resistivity. And only do a very limited circuit analysis. And later on, we'll take a careful look at what I mean by that. Now let's start by talking about our language because we want to be very clear when we use scientific ideas to describe electricity. And so we will almost never say that word by itself, electricity. So our goal is to always be specific because we'll hear students ask questions like this. You know, does this wire have electricity in it when it's not connected to anything? Or did the batter, battery run out of electricity? And what do they really mean by these questions? So instead of just using the plain word electricity, let's always be specific. So we'll say current electricity, or maybe just current. We'll say static electricity. We'll say electron current, electric energy or energy, or electrons, depending on what we're focusing on. So be very careful about just using the word electricity, which is a very general concept and really represents a grab bag of ideas. We also need to be careful in our use of language when we're comparing things because it can become very confusing very quickly. So let's suppose we make a change to a circuit. You can see circuit A and circuit B in my diagrams. So students will ask the question, does, this, does the current remain the same? And the answer is, well, it depends on what you're comparing. So we have to be really careful with our language. So be sure to define what you are comparing. So for example, if you're comparing the current going through the two batteries of these different circuits, are those currents the same? No. But if you're comparing the current going through the two bulbs of circuit B, are those currents the same? Yes. So we need to be very careful and precise. Another really helpful part of developing student understanding for the topic of electricity is creating physical models. Because most of electricity is invisible. All the goings on inside wires and the parts of a circuit, we usually don't get to see. So we need to create conceptual scientific models that help us to picture what is going on. <clears throat> so as much as possible, let's use physical evidence to help construct these models. So one of the key questions that we ask is when electrons go through a part of a circuit, like a bulb, do they get used up? Do they disappear? Now, for those watching this video presentation, you are able to click on the YouTube link here and watch this video, but uh, I can't do that for you. So I'll just go on to the next slide, but you can pause here, take a look at that video. Another example is um, relates to the concept of voltage or energy. So what is happening in a load since the electrons are not being used up or destroyed in any way? So here's another example where we look for some evidence that helps us to shape our understanding. And because the goings on of current electricity is largely invisible, it helps to create clear 
conceptually reliable models. And so this is one that I like. So this is a model of a Plinko incline where I set steel ball bearings rolling down the incline and they bump into screws along the way. So this helps to, again, create a good model for what happens inside loads of a circuit. And it puts into context the role of the different parts of the circuit, such as the source, the wires, and the load. So feel free to explore this video. So the goal of these models is to have or to develop a clear microscopic picture of what is going on in a circuit. And we start with exploring the ideas of static electricity and use that as a conceptual bridge to help build students' understanding of current electricity. These are often taught as two almost distinct topics that just by coincidence seem to have the same last name. But there's a really important conceptual connection between what goes on when we talk about static electricity and current electricity. So as we're putting together our models of the different parts of an electric circuit, there's some, there's some key physical ideas that we want our students to develop. So for example, for the source of a circuit, the voltage rise of that source is a fixed property that depends on the design, the materials, the construction of the source itself. It doesn't depend on what's connected to it or other things that are happening in the circuit. At least this is um, our approximation for an ideal source. When we think about loads, especially since we're looking at resistors, resistance is a fixed property that just depends on the materials and the shape and design of the loads. So again, it doesn't depend on the other things that we connect to that resistor. And when we think about current, the current moving through some part of the circuit, it does depend on the source, it does depend on the load. So these physical aspects of sources and loads are really important for developing the ideas or developing a useful understanding of something like Ohm's law, which relates the current voltage and resistance of different parts of a circuit. But if students don't have these elements of the physical model of how these parts work, they don't have these ideas in mind, then they will make strange predictions using Ohm's law, or they will use it in an inappropriate way. Describe the voltage of a source as changing depending on what is happening in the circuit. Now, it's really important for our students to build circuits and build lots of them. And by that, I mean actual physical circuits in front of them to do some real circuit building. They, they need this hands-on experience. They have to figure out all sorts of really basic things that most of us teachers take for granted. For example, wires have an insulated coating on them. And so they can't just conduct electricity just by touching the plastic sheath. Uh, and so connections need to be made to the conducting parts of the circuit. Uh, students also need to figure out that they need more than one wire to get energy from a battery to a bulb. I think about our gadgets that we use. We usually just connect one wire from our charger into our phone or our device, and that seems to do the trick. But when we're dealing with a really simple circuit, that doesn't work because we don't see that inside the wires of our chargers, there's actually multiple filaments of wire that conduct electricity. Another really important skill that students can start to develop when they're constructing real physical circuits is the skill of troubleshooting. And this is often uh, overlooked as a really important skill because when they first connect that circuit together, it's a good chance that it just won't work. And that's actually a really important experience for them to have because they need to figure out why. And so I set up testing stations where there are reliable parts so for example, if you're not sure if your bulb is working, you go to your testing station for the bulb, which has a reliable battery and wires. And that way through a process of elimination, they can figure out which parts of their circuit were, were faulty. Now, 
there is a really important role for simulations in students learning about current electricity. And I use simulations an awful lot, um, especially for finding quantitative patterns in what's going on. When you're working with real circuits, the patterns do get messy. Your, your batteries are imperfect, so depending on the loads that are connected to them, the voltage of the source can be different, often by small amounts, but enough to uh, lead, lead to a lot of confusion and questions on the parts of students, especially when you're comparing what's happening in this series circuit versus this parallel circuit. Those differences can start to really obscure the patterns. So I find the simulations really helpful for getting clear quantitative data as we start to build up our understanding of the patterns involved in current electricity. But really important that we remind ourselves that students still need good hands-on experiences working with these materials. Now, let's take a minute to talk about the conceptual ideas that are part of studying current electricity. And I think the big one, especially for the grade nine level, is electron current. So my advice is this is the most important idea to focus on. And so the key idea behind this is that electrons don't get used up when they go through a load. And of course, the converse, electrons don't get added when they go through a source. So this is the most important idea for students to start their understanding of electric circuits. And <clears throat> this idea of electricity in that vague sense, or electrons in particular, of getting used up is really deeply ingrained. As we talk about it all the time as the, the energy, which we often just say the electricity, just gets used up. This is part of our day-to-day -day speech. And so it's very deeply ingrained in our students' minds. So we have to really work carefully to reinforce the idea that electrons don't get used up. So to do this, we have to ask questions in steps. So we can take a look at the electrons moving in and out of a single circuit element and very carefully exploring that. Then the next step is, okay, what happens when you have elements connected in series? What are the current readings at different points along in that series branch of a circuit? And then what happens for elements connected in parallel when you start to have junction points in a circuit? So all of these ideas and the observations that they will make to build up these ideas are based on the concept that electrons do not get used up. So I just want to reinforce that this is not a trivial concept. It seems, especially to us as teachers, as the experts, really simple. But that idea of electricity getting used up is so deeply ingrained in our students' minds. We have to hammer in this point over and over again. Now, there's another important conceptual idea which students often bring, which is the, well, I'll call it the empty wire hypothesis. And so it's really easy to think of a wire as like an empty pipe. And then at some point you decide to turn on some water and it moves through the pipe. Or in our case, the electrons will move through the pipe. So is a wire like an empty pipe? Well, we need to do experiments to address that. And construct models to help students picture it. So where are the electrons in a circuit found? Where do they, in quotation marks, come from? And so I like to use a rope model to help students explain this or to visualize it. And if we think about the material of the rope as being the electrons in a circuit, that material or the electrons is always there. And really all that happens is we start to exert forces on it, which cause the rope, or in this electrical case, our electrons to move. So feel free to explore this video. And so that leads us to the idea that the wire is not empty. It is in fact electrically neutral. You can do a simple test to see that a string, for example, is not attracted to the wire when the current is turned off. If it was empty and just full of positive charge, then that's exactly what would happen. Now this simulation or this illustration here um, models another really important idea, and that is that the electrons as a group move when the electric current flows. 
And so this we call the sea of electrons. And kind of like a flow of water, these particles are moving together down along the wire. Now, once again, language is important, and our day-to-day -day language is often misleading. So we, we commonly say, oh, I need to charge my phone, as if we are saying, okay, we've got to take a bunch of electrons and cram them into our phone. Is it scientifically correct? No, absolutely not. What are we actually adding to the phone? We're actually adding energy. We're just reconfiguring the position of the charges inside the phone. Now, the second key conceptual idea that goes along with the unit on current electricity is voltage. This is a hard concept. It's challenging for my grade 11 physics students. And so I think we need to be really careful in how we use this with our grade nine. So I like to describe voltage as an idea related to energy transfers. So each group of electrons that moves through a certain part of the circuit will gain or lose a certain amount of energy. So I'll say things exactly like this. <clears throat> if it's a nine volt battery, then as each group of electrons moves through that battery, they, they gain nine units of energy. When they move through a load, that, unit of, that group of electrons loses nine units of energy or transfers it to the load itself. Uh, I don't recommend that you spend time analyzing voltage in series or parallel circuits. While students might be able to follow rote procedures, rote mathematical procedures for coming up with answers to such questions, they really don't understand what is going on. And all you have to do is get them to open their mouths about what's happening here and they'll say, really crazy things, incorrect things like when in a series circuit, <clears throat> the voltage splits up between the two resistors. And there's just nothing that's conceptually correct about that. So the idea of voltage is really tough. Let's look at it in a small number of important but simple situations. And let's not worry about doing a detailed analysis. So voltage is related to our sources, and so it's really good to have a clear idea or a clear explanation for the job of a source. So again, getting back to our rope analogy, we picture the, the job of a source as pushing electrons around the circuit. The electrons are already there everywhere in the circuit, and it's the job of the, the source to pull electrons from one side, so they take in the electrons, and then they push the electrons out from the other side. And that keeps them moving through the circuit. When it comes time to discuss energy, I like to draw an energy flow diagram. I use these a lot in my grade 11 physics course. And I, I picture, or the, the system that I wanna keep track of is what I call the system of electrons. It represents all the electrons that move within the circuit and when they move through a source, a source adds energy to the system of electrons. The system of electrons gains energy from the source. Then when electrons move through the load, the load removes energy. And so that's what this simple drawing shows. Now I mentioned before circuit analysis, and I prefer to do relatively little of this. And what I mean by circuit analysis is when you have a more or less complex example of a circuit and you've been given its basic characteristics, but the job of the student is to find all of the missing current voltage or resistance values for that circuit. So this is what I mean by circuit analysis. So you tend to use Ohm's law and then patterns for describing current in series voltage in series and so on. So I prefer not to do this with my students. I find they don't understand what's going on well enough and it very quickly moves beyond the um, ability level of our students to understand what the math that they are doing actually means. 
So this is what I save for my grade 11 physics students. So my advice is pretty much don't do this. So if you, if you are doing some basic circuit analysis, what I recommend is to focus on current in series or parallel circuits. This helps to reinforce that idea, that core idea that electrons don't get used up. And it's much more tangible in terms of a mental model for students to picture. So they have a much, they are much more likely to understand it in a reliable way. And then, um, and then do a bit of uh, Ohm's law work when you're looking at current voltage and resistance of specific elements in a circuit. So this is what I do. I focus on current and I also use Ohm's law, but very little focus on voltage. <clears throat> and when we get to the ideas of combining resistors in series and parallel, I don't worry about showing them the expressions and the parallel expression is the most complicated one. Uh, so I just take a qualitative, qualitative approach so when you connect two loads in series, what happens? Right, the resistance increases. That's great. I think that's totally good enough for a grade nine level of understanding. What happens when you connect them in parallel? The total resistance decreases. It's really strange, it takes some time to sort through, but that's also good enough for a grade nine level of understanding. Now, a lot of these elements, especially the circuit analysis, focus on the mathematical side of this unit. And I like to be very strategic in how I have my students use their math skills. So we use it sparingly, but I think wisely. Here is a question that looks like a traditional mathematical one, but we, we have an important twist to it here. And that is, we want to focus on the concepts of the ideas at work behind something like Ohm's law. And so this is a, a task that I give my students before we cover that topic. So we have three circuits and we've been given some quantitative information about these circuits. For example, we have the voltages of the sources and we have the resistances of the loads. And I'm asking the students to rank the amount of current that flows through the three bulbs of the circuit. So here, because we don't have, we haven't learned Ohm's law yet, but we can't fall back on just a simple plug and chug use of an equation. We have to think about the ideas that are involved. And that's why I think that this type of question is much better and is a good replacement for many of the traditional mathematical questions that we might ask a student to do. So for example, the thinking process might go like this. We take a look, we notice, oh yeah, our three circuits have the same voltage for their batteries, but let's look at the, at the bulbs. Oh, circuit C, its bulb has the smallest resistance. So its battery will be able to push the most current through the circuit. All right, so that has the most. And if you look at circuit B, its, its bulb has the greatest resistance. So its battery will be pushing the least amount of current through the circuit. And so we've created our ranking, but most importantly, we've really exercised our understanding about the relationship between current voltage and resistance. And so I feel that this is a much more useful of our much more effective use of our students' brain power. Now, when it comes time to do a formal calculation using something like Ohm's law, we always do this with a high degree of structure. So there's clear models and steps for students to follow. So there's never any doubt what they should be writing and what they should be showing. And at the beginning and the end, there's statements that for students to make sense of what they're doing and what the result gives or what the result means. Now we get to the grand finale and questions like this come up every, every now and then from students who start to wonder why or how, how do electrons know what to do? And this is definitely a big mystery in our understanding of current electricity. So for example, how does a battery know how much current to send through a circuit? Because the resistor is way down there. How do electrons know how to divide in parallel branches? How do they know how many should go this way? How many should go that way? Or how do they know how, to, how, to, how much energy to lose 
in the first resistor they travel through because you know they have to save a certain amount of energy for that next resistor. These are indeed mysteries. And my my answer or my my response to this is stay tuned for future presentations because unraveling these mysteries requires a deeper look at what's going on inside our electric circuits and that'll require a little bit more time. And today I just wanted to give you a quick guide for how to get yourself through the grade nine unit on current electricity. So thank you very much for joining me for this session. Um, I have all my resources available for you folks. So there's the, the PowerPoint for this particular video. Uh, there's the video, the experiment videos that I use in my lessons. And then there's the actual lesson pages, handouts and PowerPoints. So all of that is available on my course website. And of course, you have, if you have any questions about teaching current electricity, feel free to contact me at any time. Well, thanks for joining and good luck with your grade nine electricity teaching. Bye-bye.